All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lore Week. I'm your host, Lore Runner, the Lore Dude who lures, but is not an evil lore. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that topic. <clears throat> so, uh, a couple things to cover as ever before we really get started. Uh, first thing I want to mention, super quick here, is that I shouldn't have this open. One second, sorry. I had so much stuff to get ready this morning. So, everyone should watch Jongo. He's been playing through the Jedi Outcast series. It's awesome. Um, I think. He's awesome. I don't know if the game's awesome. I really don't remember it that well. Like, the more I see it, the like, I, I remembered a couple bits of the Cloud City section, and the scene where Luke is talking to him about the crystal that's gonna make the thing happen, and I'm like, yeah, I remember that scene, but the rest of it, I'm just like, I think it's one of those games that I borrowed, because I, I don't own it. I don't own Jedi Outcast, I never have. Um, I borrowed and never, and, and like, did a once-through, and for whatever reason, it just didn't stick with me. I don't know. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> uh, a couple, like I said, as ever, I like to start with just a couple quick things here. Uh, first of all, for those of you interested in World of Warcraft, uh, obviously we're not doing the Legion lore run yet. That is extremely unlikely to happen before next year at this point, uh, given how long it's going to take for Artorias to come out and be finished, and for me to finish gathering footage and, and capturing what I need to get from the game, which is still a significant amount of stuff. There's so much lore just in Legion that it's going to be a monumental undertaking just to do that one expansion. Uh, so that's being put off a little bit. Um, second of all, we've got, uh, so, so regarding WoW, though, um, there is evidence that is surprisingly cohesive that we can add to the pile of evidence that it makes it seem more and more likely that they are going to start introducing sub-races as a concept. Uh, for those of you not aware, it's, this has been something that's been bandied about by players and developers, uh, which is the key thing. And players can say however much they want about having, you know insert X feature here, and ultimately that doesn't really matter, let's just be honest with ourselves, but when developers start to say, yeah, we'd really like to have X feature, and it's something that's been tossed about several times for the last two years at this point, since Warlords was still active, and uh, so there's new evidence that's been found that indicates that it might be possible that they are actually looking into legitimately making subraces. The three that have been data mined right now sort of... It's complicated, I don't want to get into the full details, but the three ones that have been data mined so far are uh, Nightborn, which is weird, uh, for, for reasons I'm not going to get into right now. Uh, Void Elves and uh, Vrykul, I think. Oh, no, no not Vrykul, sorry, sorry, the High Mountain Tauren. Uh, those are the three that have been data mined right now. And all three of those are weird in their own way. Because there's other data files that have to do with Void Elves in, in the data mining. Um, and Nightborn don't actually have proper models. And High Mountain Tauren use basically clothing to look the way they do. In other words, in, from a programming perspective, they don't have a separate model. They are Torans who are wearing clothes, armor, equipment, etc., that are designed to to add to the Tauran skeleton to make them look like High Mountain Tauran. And Nightborn have no clothing on at all. I, I know that sounds weird. Please don't take that the wrong way. But what I mean by that is they actually aren't wearing armor from a programming perspective. Any Nightborn you see, the model you see is a full mesh. Uh, the whole thing is one cohesive model, rather than a skeleton, which has equipment grafted onto it, like most playable, ra all playable races do, and many uh, non-playable races. Like Naga, for example, have a skeleton that they can graft armor onto, just to name one example of what I'm talking about. So all of this is just weird. But I thought I'd mention that. Um, while we're in the not-really-news section, I want to talk about Visceral, because it's not really news! I'm sorry, it isn't. For those of you not aware, EA has decided to finally uh, officially shut down the Visceral name. If you've actually read the press reports and the actual statements from the people who made it, which I don't blame you if you didn't, uh, you will find lots of information that indicates that this is pretty much the exact same thing EA has always done and will probably keep doing. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, everyone's like, oh my god, Visceral is officially shut down. Uh, 
but it's not like they just closed the doors and fired 200 people. Those people are being distributed to other studios within the EI umbre EA umbrella, which is what they always do. This is, this is one of the ways they operate. I, I've talked about this. I think I talked about this last week, actually. <laughs> so, anyways. Um... <sighs> Yeah, no kidding, Carl. We did. I, I And I said it without joking, if I remember correctly. I remember thinking that and being like, oh my god, it actually isn't a joke. It's not funny. EA is legitimately cancerous. <sighs> I hate Disney. Anyways, um, but uh, the, the, I will admit I am a little bit sad because, again, you know, there's the Star Wars game they were working on, which actually sounded kind of cool. Basically, imagine the format of Dead Space 1 set in Star Wars, and you probably don't understand what I mean by that. Let me try and explain that a little bit. Um, Star Wars... Dead Space 1, remove the story, remove the horror, remove the gore, It just the skeleton of how the game is constructed. Linear narrative through series of set pieces, um, first-person shooter kind of thing, that. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Think about that, and then set that kind of a game in Star Wars, like like kind of like an un, uncharted game in Star Wars, kind of, or maybe closer to something like a Bioshock in Star Wars, you know, something like that, right? Um, and that sounded kind of cool. I was on board with that. Uh, that has basically been shot out into the sun. They have talked about what they're changing the game into, and again, I don't have the quotes handy, but they're turning it into another cookie cutter multiplayer bullcrap. Uh, Star Wars game, which is stupid. And is this not on random? It's not on random. I apologize. There we go. So. Yeah, so now we're getting this stupid, you know, service multiplayer Star Wars Destiny thing, which, which basically means completely changing what the original game was into something new. So for all intents and purposes, uh, they might they might uh, salvage some of the art assets from and, and, and sound design assets from the previous game, but for all intents and purposes, they are making a new game. So, yay! But now let's get to actual news. Real news. Because that's not news. I'm sorry, it isn't. It's just, it's what happens. It has been happening since the 90s. I want you to think about that for a moment. For 27-ish years, EA has been doing this. How many of you are younger than 27? <laughs> You don't have to answer that question. You don't have to give out your age. But, I mean, think about that for just a moment. Not new. How many of you know what Elysium is in regards to news this last week? There you go. Hates Disney. You are younger than EA has been doing this. Not EA the company, just how long they've been doing this. Uh, Elysium was a private World of Warcraft server. Uh, very good, Stark Mafia, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it had some drama. And I kind of wanted to talk about this because it's actually a, it's a pretty complicated situation. And I felt it was worth discussing. But I'm going to start with a quote, okay? And this quote is a quote of me. This is one of my quotes, okay? You take anything, you get money into the mix, and things get weird. That's the quote. I know it's a really dumb quote, but it's so freaking true. It is so commonplace to have a, an, an otherwise normal situation... Then money gets involved, and then things get weird. Drama happens. You know, yelling and fighting and legal battles and rights issues and, and wars in some cases. <sighs> Elysium was the private World of Warcraft server that obviously had expenses involved with keeping the server active. Duh. And a lot of those expenses were going toward... Uh, were, were being brought in thanks to uh, donations and charity from people, okay? I think he's dead, Jongo. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Because I don't want him suddenly showing up one day and stabbing me or something. To retake the throne. The lore throne. That's now invisible. You see, I even covered it in green, so now you can't see the lore throne. 
These donations... This is... I think I'm on the wrong playlist. Hang on just a second. I'm on the wrong playlist. There we go. Turn that down a little bit so it's not too loud. Oh, maybe you can't even hear it. I don't know. I can never know what you guys hear. So, I'm trying to think of how I want to present this information. One thing I've noticed, I even ranted about it this morning on uh, on, on Discord, because it's, it's just something that keeps coming up, and it keeps pissing me off. If I was to give you the bare bones of information, I imagine most of you would have a knee-jerk reaction to that. I've done this a few times on Lorwick, if you've been paying attention. Like, sometimes I'll be like, all right, here's a game with such and such, and, and these microtransactions or whatever, and then I just stop waiting for reactions, and then I give you the full info, which makes things, you know, a little more fleshed out, a little more uh, in detail than, than the knee-jerk reaction. But basically, um, a lot of news sites have been reporting that the founders and creators of the Elysium server have been stealing money from the server and have and are, are under the suffrage of corruption. Now I want to make this clear, this is corruption in the economic sense, uh, which is actually a legitimate economic term. In other words, it refers to specifically and deliberately utilizing your position in order to what we usually refer to as skim. Just cut a little bit off the top there and, uh, and you know, take that for yourself, you know, corruption. Um, that's what most people are reporting. The reality of the situation is a little bit more complex than that. But Elysium itself is probably gone at this point because of how much their reputation has been tattered by how much people are talking about, oh my god, corruption, etc. The reality of the situation is a little more complicated, and in fact, we won't know the full 100% of it, but the people in charge have fully admitted to engaging in two different types of activities specifically involved in running the Elysium server. One of them has admitted that they were skimming some of the money from the from the uh, donations for the specific purpose of doing things like paying bills so that they could afford to work less, so that they could afford to work on the server more. Is that a mitigating circumstance? That's not for me to judge. That's just the information that we have at our disposal. Um, the other person was engaging in something that was a little bit le more, less gray, uh, more judgeable. <laughs> Uh, the other pe people, I should say people, excuse me. I'm not going to name names, by the way. Um, the other people involved were basically encouraging and allowing gold selling. Now, there's some conflicting information here. Some people insist that they were inviting gold sellers who would then go and farm gold and then they would get a piece of the profit for allowing the gold sellers to continue existing. Some people were insisting that they were generating gold and then selling the gold themselves directly, kind of like how Blizzard itself sort of does now. Kind of, sort of. Actually, that's not true. Blizzard doesn't do that, now that I think about it. What we're referring to, what I'm referring to is is Blizz, is the, the person at the console literally typing generate gold enter and therefore creating gold that previously didn't exist within the system and then trying to sell that to players. This is one of the two possibilities of what's happening, the other being gold farming. Uh, gold farming doesn't really qualify that and Blizzard doesn't actually do that, so forgive me for misspeaking there. So... Uh, this, this is a little more judgeable, because the whole reason this was being done was to generate more money for the server, to keep the server running. Which is a, a valid reason, possibly. And I have to say possibly, because we don't know if that's actually a legitimate reason or if this was just to get a little more additional money. However, uh, this person, and these people, excuse me, I keep misspeaking, these people were also skimming from the top of the gold selling market in order to put money into their own pockets. And these people have not said this was for the sake of, you know, keeping work on the server. This was just something they were doing. And there are uh, records that could be considered legitimate that showcase that this has actually been happening, the skimming from the gold selling market, because they have access to dev records. Of course they do. Now, whether this is true or not, I cannot legitimately judge, and I want to always start with that. You know, I don't know what exactly was happening with regards to the gold selling. There was gold selling happening. We could say that with 100% certainty. Um, and gold selling, as Roximus is talking about in chat right now, is not a good thing 
for uh, in, in either of the two methods that I just in indicated, because that is going to significantly affect player economy and change the very dynamic by which the, the players have to assume value exists for the in-game currency, which will, by definition, change how the developers have to value that same currency going forward within the course of the game. The developers can't ignore an in-game economy when, when creating a game. That, that leads to problems. <laughs> And we're past that. This is not the 90s or the early 2000s anymore. We've, we've solved those problems. So, one way or another, gold selling is a pretty definitively bad thing when it comes to uh, an MMO. Now, I want to clarify something really quick, okay? I'm actually fully in favor of what Blizzard is doing. And I want to explain why that's separate. Because Blizzard is not selling gold. Blizzard is selling a token, which you can sell in-game for gold. No gold is being generated in the market. No, There's nobody typing into a command saying, make gold exist, that previously did not. The gold that is being sold is actually coming from another player, which means it's already a part of the existing economy. It is moving the gold more which is why I think it's a good thing, and it's legalizing and making a more legitimate and safer method by which players can procure gold for real money if they choose to, because let's face it, nobody has ever, ever succeeded in really fighting off the gold spammers in any MMO going back to the 90s. So, I'm in favor of this because of combating the gold spammers, because of legitimizing the method for players who want to take that option, and because of the fact that it, while it affects the economy, is not like a colossal smash in the face to the economy like legitimately crafting gold will do, okay? So as a consequence of this, uh, Elysium is still going, but I, I honestly would give them a month at the outside for how long that's going to last. Hi, April. Um... And uh, I, I don't even know how long that's going to keep going. Most of the the uh, other people in charge who quit in, in you know citing corruption decided to go and make their own uh, WoW server with blackjack and hookers uh, called Lights Hope Chapel. For anybody interested in looking into that, I'll go ahead and toss the name out there. That's up to you. I have no idea how they're going to avoid the same general problems that the previous server had, since so many of the same people are involved, and the same problems still exist. That problem being money because money is needed to run a private server. It is not needed to play a private server. It's one of the appeals for several players, is that they can just hop on and play for free. But uh, someone needs to pay for that server space, and the bandwidth, and like 30 other things I don't even feel like going into right now. So we'll see how that goes. It's like I said, when money gets involved, things get weird. Really, really weird. And the more money, the worse, by the way. You think this is bad? This is nothing. <sighs> Speaking of money and possible corruption and possible scummy activity, who's heard about the Activision stuff? Anybody? Oh, Activision stuff. So, before... Uh, I suppose I should go ahead and just kind of... No, it is not, Chicken QT. That is absolutely not true. There is no such thing as 100% safe on a private server ever. Um, let's go ahead and give a quick info bomb for those of you not aware. Uh, Hazel One, Activision has petitioned for a patent that would enable them to use an entirely new matchmaking algorithm. I'm saying this wrong. A add a new algorithm to their existing matchmaking protocols that would try to encourage players towards uh, towards microtransactions, towards buying in-game guns and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so Activision has petitioned for that patent. That's the info bomb, that's the facts. Now, I do not have the capacity to 100% prove this, but I have... Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I just realized we have a vote going on. I just realized I've been talking for all this long. Hang on, hang on. Let me move this up here. There we go. Make sure you go voot. Uh, and there's the poll. Really quick. Sorry. Back on topic. So, uh, I was never able to 100% prove this, but I'm pretty sure Modern Warfare 3's multiplayer did something similar. Um, 
I'm almost almost positive about that. I would say with like 95% certainty. The only difference was that the uh, the microtransactions were a little more a little less intrusive, I should say, and the very microtransaction environment of the industry was a lot less pervasive back when Modern Warfare 3 uh, came out. Now, I mention this because the way it would work, and I'm reasonably certain other games have done this as well, but I'm really, really certain Modern Warfare 3 did this. Let's say you are just starting Modern Warfare 3. You know what? It doesn't even matter. Uh, let's say you're just starting insert multiplayer game here. Doesn't matter which. And so you're like, all right, I'm going to go and play Matchmaker. And another game, uh, the game looks at you and says, well, you're a noob. I'm going to match you up against people who have specifically purchased weapons or are higher level than you. And then they're going to destroy you. And then you're going to be all angry and upset about that. So you're either going to go purchase weapons yourself, which is what we want. Quit, which, what are, what are you going to do about that? Or grind up until you get to the point where you are at the level they were at. So, this is... Uh, this is a method of matchmaking that I'm pretty sure goes back to the early thousands as far as implementation. Uh, I, I forget what they actually call it, but it's something along the lines of encouraging player progression something something. Now, I've always found that pretty scummy myself. Uh, I tend to prefer matchmaking that matches a noob up against another noob. Call me a weirdo. Oh, I'm pretty sure Hearthstone does something like this too uh, for some of its uh, random matches. So, uh, anyways, oh yes, they've also stated that they, uh, they don't actually use this algorithm currently. Although, if you look at the statement, they were specifically referring to Destiny. Uh, and Destiny 2, excuse me, not anything else, so who knows on that. Anyways, the relevant point here, other than the fact that this is obviously super scummy, is that even though, how do I put this? This gets into something I have talked about. A lot recently, actually. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Panic. I know exactly what you're talking about there. Um, yeah, as Sean is pointing out, this is so scummy because it works so well. Let's look at all of the people who might be involved in this. Like, again, I'm not a super big multiplayer PvP fan. I, I haven't been in a very long time. But... Let's say I was the kind of person who was like, you know what, I'm going to try the multiplayer of insert game here. Doesn't matter which. Let's, let's just make up a game. We're going to call it uh, Seltzer Water uh, Destructo, okay? And you go in and you shoot different flavors of Seltzer Water people, okay? We're with you. You with me? So, you pop into the game. Now, that algorithm takes place. So you're fighting people who have bought weapons or have bought skins or whatever. Both are valid, by the way. Both apply in the same way, because if you're fighting people who have bought weapons, they're going to beat you because their weapons are better. World of Tanks, by the way. That's another example I should have used. World of Tanks does this. Um, if you're fighting people who ha who look cooler, then you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm inclined to get this. Actually, as weird as this sounds, because I usually don't actually agree with the man, Jim Sterling and I are on the same page as this one. Because even if a, a microtransaction is purely cosmetic, that is still something that can and is pushed onto the player as far as part of the overall marketing idea behind microtransactions. This is the wrong song for this discussion. You know, I'm gonna, I actually have a playlist specific for this kind of thing. I don't know why I'm not playing it. Forgive me. Let's just get down to this. There we go. Um, the skins don't make them pro, Roximus, but the skins look cool. And I know plenty of players out there are like me and like looking cool. In like any game. How much time has been spent going and gathering transmog gear in World of Warcraft, or glamour gear in FF14, or trying to get certain armor in a Dark Souls game so they can look specifically a certain thing? This is a very big thing. Lots of gamers care about how they look in video games. Not that uncommon. So you're playing Seltzer Water Destructo, and you see someone over there who's got this really rare Canada dry skin, and it's like, oh, dude, that is awesome. Dude, I totally want that. And then it's like, wait, no! And, uh... I mean, even if they have the same actual equivalent of gear or whatever as you, they look really cool. 
And now it's in your head. That that look, that skin. I wonder how I could get that. Hmm. Aha! You know, I just have to buy it. Either from an in-game auction or from uh, in, in a real money shop or whatever. This is something. This is a real thing. And we should at least acknowledge this. <sighs> so, um... I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit off track here. The point being, so you're playing this game. Now, you are being pushed. It is being pushed upon your psychology to try and procure these things, either because they are better gear or because they are cool looking. Both of these are valid for the same reason. Now, let's look at the different type of players who are going to be part of this market. There's people like me who will look at that and say, nope, <laughs> I ain't spending a dime on this. You want me to spend microtransactions on a game, you gotta earn it. You gotta actually have a really good game that gets me invested in, okay, now I'm interested in it. Now I'll actually feel free to go ahead and do that, right? That has happened to me, and I will freely admit that. But that's always a case-by-case -case basis. If you're trying to push this on to me, I admit I am a little bit contrarian when it comes to this. It's something I try to fight against, ironically. But if you're trying to push this kind of thing on me, I will be less invested. Especially if it's a gear thing. If I'm getting curb stomped left and right, my mentality is, this isn't fun, and no matter what I do, I, can't, I don't even have a chance to get better. How many of you have played a multiplayer FPS game, specifically a deathmatch shooter, where you don't have the ability to get better at the game because you die so quickly you don't gain experience? You know what I'm talking about, I bet. I'll be I bet a lot of you know what I'm talking about there. This can actually apply in single player games, too, in under certain circumstances. Like, you know, you, you, you get really good at getting back to the boss, but then the boss kills you in three seconds, so you don't actually get any practice on figuring out how to fight the boss. So you get really good at the run from the save point to the boss, but you get to the boss and it's like, uh... Because you don't get any practice. There's a difference between repetition and practice, right? So, the market that I am a part of would say, I'm out! I leave. Well... No loss, no gain, because I probably wasn't going to buy that sort of thing anyways. So that's a net neutral for uh, for the company. Now let's say there's people who either are rich, I, I shouldn't say rich, are comfortable, or have family, that you know, parents, who are comfortable. These people, let's just go ahead and refer to these people as whales, because that's what they are, who are like, dude, that guy's gun is better than me. Bye. Wait, that other guy has an even better gun. Buy. You know, I'm just going to buy the best guns. There we go. I now have the best seltzer water. That's market two. Uh, these people have been pushed to... These people would probably have bought it anyways. Uh, no, I did not, Zed. I didn't see that a response had been levied. Um, and I believe you, Panic, completely on that. Uh, these people were already going to buy something. So this pushing thing doesn't really do anything for them, really. These people were already going to buy and spend money on these kind of microtransactions. So we've got the no loss, and then we've got the already going to get it. The in-between, and I've talked about this concept so many times, it's the in-between that really matter. Because the in-between people are the people on the fence. And when you push, people on the fence are more likely to go one way or the other based on how you're pushing and based on the individual. These kind of aggressive tactics, these are kind of aggressive... This is a form of aggressive marketing, so let's just call it what it is. These kind, this kind of aggressive marketing is specifically designed to try and push those people who are on the fence to going ahead and buying this stuff. Let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, let's say I'm playing Seltzer Wars or whatever the hell we called it. Uh, Seltzer, Seltzer Water Destructo. And Bob over there, because there's, there's a million Bobs in the world, Bob is also playing with it. He's a friend of mine. Now, he really likes the game. Like, he legitimately enjoys the game. And I kind of like the game. But he's getting really upset that, that we keep losing because those guys over there have this better gear than we do, okay? So now, I am being pushed to go ahead and put real money into the game solely for the sake of being able to keep up because I have a pre-existing investment into this, namely my friend who's playing, who wants to do this. So he's someone who is probably in the already going to buy, or leaning towards the gonna buy part of the fence, and he is now dragging someone else onto his side of the fence as we go through this. This could of course go in the opposite direction as well. It's always going to be case by case. 
But you see how this can get a little insidious on, a, on an individual basis on how many people are going to be dragged one way or the other by this kind of aggressive marketing. Also, Guild Wars 1 Ritualist for life. <laughs> and that's why this is insidious and stupid and horrible and awful, in my blunt opinion. I tend to be against aggressive marketing in general. Um, I tend to be very anti-aggressive marketing. I think if you've reached the point where you're pushing aggressive marketing, then you've got some moral and ethical quandaries to really sit down and think on or get the hell out of the business. Now, that's my opinion. The problem is, if, if, if I could be blunt, in addition to the whole aggressive marketing thing, this the reason this is so damn horrible could really be summarized by the fact that it's affecting the game. I hate to bring up this example yet again, but this keeps being relevant. Shadow of War, okay? Shadow of War. Microtransactions don't freaking matter for that game. They don't. Not even in the post-game. They, they don't. I'll, I, there is no legitimate incentive that is being pushed on me to spend real money on buying loot boxes in Shadow of War. And that's one of the reasons why I was willing to go ahead and give it an unequivocal yes, you should buy this game kind of a rating, right? I, I call that my stamp of definitely recommended for a reason. But... The whole point there is that the actual game is unaffected by the microtransactions. Um, other games, and I, I, there's so many examples, I'm not even going to list, list any, but other games, the actual game is being changed. The actual game is being affected by the inclusion of these microtransactions in certain cases and by the inclusion of these kind of aggressive tactics. You understand? I, I know you do. Um, as much as I love Diablo 3, I will point to the Real Money Auction House as an example of a thing where the inclusion of that game, of, of that function, legitimately changed how the game itself was. In other words, I can't say that if you play Diablo 3 at launch, at vanilla, without ever touching the Real Money Auction House, or the Auction House for that matter, that you would be getting the same experience as someone who does, because it affects the game. They ch actually legitimately changed drop values, and they actually changed the way that certain uh, suffixes added were, were added to bosses, or not bosses, champions, excuse me, and how uh, certain loot was being generated because of that. Does that make sense, Anthony? Am I explaining this correctly? Let's say... Let me use a, a made-up example, okay? Because I don't want to name... There, there's actually too many examples here to get into, and I don't want to get into to poo-flinging. <sighs> I know, right? So go, nowadays, I would recommend Diablo 3 without hesitation, but when it came out... Eh. Let's say you have a game which has a difficulty curve like this, okay? Nice and linear, corner to corner, boom, okay? Now, let's say, as you're going through this game, the game has been designed to present upon you gear or talent ups, or whatever, so that your relative power level is this, okay? You're only coming up to about here. Now, some people are still going to be able to play this game and beat this game. They're still going to be able to go through this, but plenty of people are going to be like, ugh, because they're just so much lower in power level than what they should be, okay? Now, let's say we have this situation, and these people are... The reason this balance of difficulty has been set up this way is that the way you get the gear or the, 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 the augments, or whatever the hell, that puts you up to this point, in terms of power level, is by buying it with microtransactions. Uh, this is actually literally the definition of pay to win. <laughs> you know, pay to win is when you are paying money to keep up with the, the way the game has been designed to encourage you to pay money to keep up. That is the concept of how microtransactions can affect a game in a nutshell. I agree, Diablo 3 is great. I still really want to do a play another playthrough of the game on the Necromancer. I don't know what you're talking about, Tigzar. I think you're on crack. Anyways, um... 
so yeah, that's 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 the nutshell of the whole Activision situation thing. And the, the reason so many people, this is the other thing I want to mention, um, the reason so many people have such valid complaints about the Activision patent is the fact that this is by definition going to affect gameplay. Because if you go, we already talked about this, because if you go to matchmake, it's like random, you know, random game. And, uh, oh, gotcha. I understand what you're saying. No, take zero. Um, shrug. I don't feel like renaming it right now. Uh, if you go to matchmake and you're like, all right, I can't wait to play this game. Your experience is going to be changed because of this kind of algorithm. If they implement it, if they if they decide to implement a microtransaction encouraging algorithm, then even if you don't buy the microtransactions, your gameplay in this multiplayer competitive game is still going to be changed by the fact that it has been included and taken into account with regards to the game itself. Make sense? <sighs> Blah. One of these days I'm going to have some news to talk about for Lower Week that's going to be like legitimately awesome. Like, not a net positive, just like an overwhelming positive. Like, dude, guys, this awesome thing happened, and it'll be great. I can't wait. <sighs> so. <laughs> Let's, uh... <laughs> yes, now is Lore Week. <laughs> uh... Activision. I... You know, I gotta be honest, I kind of haven't paid attention to Activision in a while. Not really. There. With an A, is that correct now? In Pleasant. I gotta look it up. You might be look it up now. Unpleasant. Yeah, it is unpleasant. There. Fixed. Now shut up. Oh yeah, sorry. Ugh. There we go. There. Got it out, got it out. So unfortunately, <laughs> I do have one other little bit of thing to talk about. It's not actually negative, although I might rant a little bit here, so forgive me if I get a little ranty. Um, let's talk about Alex Kurtzman really quick. So, I bet most of you are like, who? Uh, and if you say that, then I have not been doing my job properly, because I... I have, like, a private vendetta against Alex Kurtzman. I'm not even kidding. The man is such... I mean, I am kidding. I don't have a vendetta. Uh, I have so much hatred for this man. Uh, he's... If, you, if you've heard me talk about bad writing uh, when it comes to uh, movies, you've probably heard me mention this man. Uh, I'm just going to toss out a couple quick movies for you. Um, the Amazing Spider-Man 2. Transformers 2. Star Trek Into Darkness. I had this problem last week, so I'm going to make sure I'm talking about the correct person. Yeah, that's him. He also wrote the recent In the Mu in, uh, Mummy movie. Okay, so I, I... Just making sure. I am saying the right person. I'm even saying his name right. Alec, Alex Kurtzman. Uh, this guy's the worst writer I've seen in, prof in the professional industry, and I mean that without hyperbole. I mean that without any kind of exaggeration whatsoever. This guy is a literal textbook example of bad writing. I have used this man's writings as a method by which to explain what not to do when it comes to writing. I'm not even kidding. <sighs> Again, no exaggeration. No nothing. <sighs> so. Uh, he's also involved in Star Trek Discovery, by the way. <laughs> but that's why I'm bringing this up. Alex Kurtzman uh, made a comment, and there was some elaboration on this. Uh, there was some discussion about... Oh, how does he keep jobs, Saldir? That's an excellent question. I have an answer for you. How well did Transformers 2 sell? How well did Into Darkness sell? You gotta realize, from certain people's perspectives, this man has a great resume. Because he has written movies that sold really well. Yeah. Anyways, getting back to my point. Um, 
So this man, uh, actually, th the reason I don't give him credit for writing the original uh, 2009 Star Trek is because J.J. Abrams was also involved in writing the 2009 Star Trek, uh, and he was not when it came to Into Darkness. <laughs> you know what, Blue Wolf Alex? I agree. Um... <laughs> Damn it, Bregman. Ow, ow. Ah, you're making my back hurt. Ah. Okay. <laughs> the reason I bring him up yet again, because I, I bring him up so many times in, in my work, I really do, uh, is that he recently made a comment which made me think, and uh, he talked about an episode of Star Trek The Original Series. Um, does anybody out there know of the episode uh, City on the Edge of Forever? It is among, but not the, most famous Star Trek episodes ever. So I wouldn't be surprised if most of you who aren't even Star Trek fans have probably heard of this episode. Um, it's uh, Ironically, Trouble with Tribbles is actually more famous, but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> City on the Edge of Forever is an episode, spoiler alert, in 3, 2, 1, where Kirk and crew find the Guardian of Forever, which functions as a semi-sentient time portal, go back to uh, the 1920s, I want to say, uh, United States, and end up accidentally altering history. Oh, excuse me, 1930s. Uh, end up accidentally altering history, blah, blah, blah. It is a very good episode, in my opinion. It is among the best of Star Trek, in my opinion. Uh, that being said... Kurtzman made the comment, and I'm going to try to do this word for word, because I hate Alex Kurtzman, and I don't want to be accused of uh, misreporting. So I wrote down his sentence word for word. You couldn't do City on the Edge of Forever now because Kirk would have to spend a whole season mourning Edith Keeler. I'm going to stop there and see if anybody has any reaction to that sentence before I really get into my topic. And I'm going to pull my, my pillow into my lap because my back hurts like hell today. I'm sorry, guys. Ugh. They did, Mikes. That's true, they did. <laughs> it was part of a... Uh, it was part of a, uh, a convention panel. And Kurtzman was being asked certain questions. And the general gist, the overall point that he was trying to make, was that serialized episodes, serialized television, I should say, is a bad thing. Now, let me explain what that means really quick. Uh, serialized mean is a series of episodes which are supposed to follow a general type of continuity. Um, now, I have to put this generalized thing. I have my own terms that I use rather than serialized. I, I use string continuity and setting continuity as my two ways to explain it. So if you've seen me talk on my Voyager series, you've ta heard me talk about these two concepts extensively. I talked about it on Babylon 5 as well. Um, it's really easy to, to compare these two, but I don't think I need to get into that. I think you understand the concept of string continuity, one episode strings directly into the next, and setting continuity, where things happen and change the impact of the world, therefore impacting future episodes. These are the two major forms of serialization. Um, now, the original intention for Star Trek, the original series, was the opposite of serialization. Uh, which I, I can't actually remember the proper term for that. Forgive me, I can never remember the damn term. But basically, it's the Twilight Zone. Uh, it's the easiest and simplest way to explain it. Everyone's, seen, everyone's heard of the Twilight Zone, right? Almost everyone's seen the, Star, uh, the Twilight Zone. Um, the point behind that is that every episode is completely separate from every other episode, and episodes can be played in any order, and it doesn't change anything or matter. Now... There are legitimate, actual arguments that can be leveled for having the Twilight Zone style of, of storytelling. And I mean, honestly, the original series kind of follows that as well, for the most part. Um, Star Trek has gone all over the place when it regards this. Is it episodic? God, you know, I really don't remember. I'll look it up really quick, because you guys are asking me. Hang on, hang on. Making me look up terms. <sighs> 
apparently, uh, the other term is simply episodic. So there you go. The official no really term is just episodic. Oh. Um, sorry, my back is really killing me just all of a sudden. It's been fine all morning. Um, so, uh, Alex Kurtman gave this comment saying that you couldn't do, you know, again, I'm going to do this word for word, you couldn't do City on the Edge of Forever now because Kirk would have to spend a whole season mourning Edith Keeler. Now, I am obviously in favor of serialization, uh, whichever form of continuity you fall, whether it's setting continuity or string continuity. I do like both. Um, not really, Zawan. The vast majority of TOS could be slotted in wherever and it wouldn't affect anything. I could probably sit down and figure out how many episodes are affected by continuity. There are some, but it's like seven out of the 69 or whatever. <sighs> um, but yeah, so obviously I'm in favor of serialization. I've made that opinion very, very clear, and I've made my opinion why that is very, very clear. That's I, I didn't want to, to start this topic point to get up on a soapbox, uh, although I do like telling everyone that Alex Kurtzman is still a goddamn moron. Um, see, the problem here is Alex Kurtzman is currently involved in producing a serialized TV show set in Star Trek. <laughs> a weekly show... Twilight Zone, Sean. Twilight Zone is the easiest example. Really. Twilight Zone has no continuity. None. It is the most extreme example of an episodic television show. Um... Why in God's name is this man in charge of Star Trek Discovery? I still haven't seen Discovery, by the way. I, I have not had time. Um, yeah, Tales from the Crypt. That's another good example. Uh, I have not had time, so I'm not judging whether the show is good or not. Why the hell is this idiot in charge of a serialized show? Which, which has a... I do know that Discovery has a fairly strong serialization. In fact, by all accounts, it sounds like they're trying for a form of string continuity. Um when it comes to Star Trek Discovery. You know what happens, historically speaking, when you have someone in charge of a show who is adamantly opposed to the concept... Could someone like the vote really quick, please? Um, who is uh, adamantly opposed to the show? What you usually have is someone who goes out of their way to either passively or actively tries to sabotage the show because they don't agree with it. Because they think that by making something crash and burn then they will be able to do things the way they want to because they're stupid and don't understand that you don't get a second chance after that. Episodic does have its strengths. I said that, Zawan. I don't agree, personally, but I have pointed out many times, especially in my Voyager stuff, that there is a point to... There is a legitimate argument, several arguments, actually, for the in benefit of episodic. Again, that's not my point. My point is that this is yet another reason why I think that Star Trek Discovery is going to crash and burn. And as weird as this may sound, I'm actually really sad about that. God damn it. <laughs> I also want to slap Alex Kurtzman in the face until the blood stops coming out. <laughs> Freaking jackass. Sorry, sorry. But I also want to point out that he's an idiot. In addition to everything else, I want to point out that he's an idiot. May I please explain why? So, let's use his specific example. Let's go straight back to his words. Let's not misquote or misrepresent or anything. You couldn't do City on the Edge of Forever now because Kirk would have to spend a whole season mourning Edith Keeler. Why is that a problem? Why would it be a difficulty to tell an actor, okay, you're still emotionally recovering from this significant negative. Why is it that having a small backstory bit of a character slowly being changed and affected by a life-altering event is a bad thing? Why is the idea that something horrific and catastrophic has happened to someone that so significantly alters a character that they should have a complete character arc devoted just to that one point considered a bad thing? In fact, I got a perfect example of this garbage. Star Trek Voyager, uh, Real Life is the name of the episode. 
one of the few episodes of Voyager that actually made me cuss because I was that angry at it. Anyone remember that one? Quick summary if you don't. Real Life is the episode in which uh, the Doctor tries to have a hologra holographic family and then hit, stuff happens, stuff happens, and then his daughter dies. And it is presented really well. In, in, in no small part, thanks to... Uh, Oh, God, I suddenly can't think of the actor's name. Um, Robert Picardo, who plays the Doctor, who did an absolutely amazing presentation of someone who is being grief-stricken by losing their child. <laughs> and then the very next episode, it doesn't matter at all, and it is never brought up again. It has nothing to do with anything. That is probably the single biggest reason why I am more in favor. Uh, did, you, did it really, Blue Wolf Alex? That's funny. Um, we both got pissed off by the same thing. Uh, it, it, that is so anti-character. That is so anti-character. <laughs> you know? Did Data ever mention LOL? You know, I'm not sure he did, now that you think of that. I don't know, I'll have to pay attention as I'm going through TNG. Anyways. I think I've made my point. I think I've made my point. Let's move on. Forgive me for ranting, I really needed to get that one off my chest. That honestly pissed me off. Uh, the vote is a tie. Of course it is. By the way, we have a vote. We have a vote going on. Let's talk about writing really quick. Let's let's shift off of these horrible topics here. We'll even change playlists from the dead playlist. I guess that's what this playlist is called. To something a little happier. Uh, where's my overworld playlist? I've got an overworld playlist. Uh, everyone likes Mario Galaxy music, right? There we go. All right, let's talk about something happy. So... What is the game for the live rumination? I have deliberately not told anyone. Just like I haven't told anyone what the uh, exploration would be. I have a question for you guys. This is this is no, like, uh, this, is, this isn't intended to be a news bit. Um, this is something that came to me. I've been having a really hard time sleeping the last two nights uh, because of how much pain I've been in. And they've been giving me nightmares. You know, I, I finally pass out from exhaustion. And the pain gives me nightmares, and then I wake up. And then, so that's, that just happens like six times throughout the night. I'm sorry, I, I know I said I was talking about happy stuff. I'm getting there, I swear. So, <laughs> uh, in the middle of the night, I was getting tired of ugh, pain, ugh, pain, ugh, pain. Um, and finally, I just started writing. I just, I just pulled out my phone. I actually have an app specifically for this. And I just started writing notes and like little outlines for a story that I've been working on for a while called Extant. Um, and I was writing this story out, and one of the things I like to do when I'm writing a story is I like to sit down and think, what is the point? I, I don't like to just write a story because. I like to write a story because I have a purpose, a, a relevance to the story. So I start sitting down, I'm like, alright, let's think about all the major characters like Grizzle and Lavari and Dranith and all that. There's also a game named Arch, in the, or a character named Arch in this um, believe it or not. And, alright, let's, let's write all this out. And I started thinking about it. One of the pieces of advice of writing I've heard in my life it boils down to something like this. Oh, I use speech-to-text. My chromato. I, I don't do... No. Um, I'll do that if I have a keyboard on the phone, but I don't on an iPhone, so I do speech-to-text. So, um... If you're, you're writing a story about this character, right? So the question you have to ask yourself as a writer is, is this the most interesting part of this character's life? And if not, why aren't you writing about that story? Has anyone ever heard of this? I forget the gentleman who says it, but it's a very commonly repeated uh, writing concept. Now I gotta wait <laughs> for people to respond.
I hear it all the time, honestly. Now, this is the concept I want to talk about because I disagree, personally. I wanted to, I wanted to ask the question before I mentioned the fact that I disagree with that concept. Uh, I think there's plenty of purpose behind having uh, Day of the Life writings or uh, just character pieces, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, let me give you an example. Gary, are you still there? <laughs> Now I gotta wait <laughs> to see if Gary's still there. Um, also, lower decks episodes tend to be a good example of uh, the type of writing that is not the most interesting part of that person's life. Um, what's that uh, Studio Ghibli anime that I actually really liked? That I legitimately enjoyed and really liked sitting through? Uh, something, something delivery, I want to say. Yeah, Slice of Life is literally a genre. Kiki's Delivery Service. Now, I don't know how many of you like that, but I... This is not... This is the wrong song. There we go. Let's go with this one. Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is a fantastic example of a story that is basically a slice of life story. That is... This is just a portion. It's just a portion of this person's life. Uh, yes, it's, it's Studio Ghibli. It's an anime, Jongo. It's one of the extremely few animes I really enjoyed. Uh, I shouldn't say anime because it's actually a movie. Um, but you know what I mean. And uh, it's just... A, a, it, there's no, like, real central antagonistic plot. There's no death of the universe or anything like that. It's just... It's, it's her life, right? And I like that. Uh, it's very down to earth. Uh, hell, I even have a trope that I myself use—a lorium, excuse me—that uh, I call the O'Brien to refer to a character who is specifically designed to be this kind of thing. <sighs> um, and I like that. I do enjoy that type of storytelling. But this brings me to the extant thing, and I legitimately want your guys' input on this. So I'm writing extant, and I realized I have no central antagonist and no central. Uh, threat, for lack of a better term. Um, and I can't decide if I should invent one or not. If I should come up with something or not. Now, there is a central theme. There is a unified pillar behind all the different character stories going throughout it. Uh, Extant is designed to be a story... Um, now what? That's the whole concept. Uh, immediately prior to Extant... There was a war that happened, which was heavily based off of the uh, off of a combination of Star Wars and the original Homeworld, and I freely admit both of those. And so, this war happened, and this colossal catastrophic thing happened. And there's a few specific. I'm not going to give you all this detail. Nobody cares about. It. <laughs> ah! Nobody cares about fear. <laughs> Thank you as ever, Dark Ray. Very much appreciated, sir. Um, uh, th this war happened. Again, nobody wants to hear about one of my stupid stories. Uh, so this massive war happens, and they beat the big bad guy. You know, the evil Lord Dude, right? They beat him. And then the story, you know, that story, which I have no intention to ever write. That's not the point. Ends. This happens a few years later. Just a couple of years later. This is... The, the entire point of this is... Uh, I was inspired to write this story because... Now what? Because I I can't remember any example except for one in my life. And of... Uh, I can't remember any example... Aside from one... Of a story that actually dealt with the... Now what? Okay, we beat... Emperor Palpatine. We, we killed Lord Dudeface. I... God, I can't even think of an example. How many games have been ended by killing some big evil guy or girl or whatever or object and then the end? <sighs> right? Thrawn Trilogy is the one example I'm thinking of, actually. Uh, and I will freely admit the Extant storyline was partially inspired by the Thrawn Trilogy because the Thrawn Trilogy is a now what story. It's the only one I can think of. I'm sure there's other examples. I just couldn't think of any when I made that statement earlier. 
You know what? I'll agree. Ten two is actually a now what story. I hadn't thought about that because it's so badly presented, but you are right. Ten two is it? Is, so, anyways, yeah. And there's all these. I, I have several character arcs and story arcs going throughout it. Um, a lot of the point is to show different perspectives of the now what. So we've got the everyman whose life has been completely altered by these catastrophic events going way above his head. Um, we've got a very charismatic individual who by circumstance has ended up with a with the most powerful military fleet in the sector who has no political or military ambitions he just wants to get back to thing it's like ah. um we've got some mercenaries who were involved in the war and that's supposed to be mostly an ethic based story we've got someone who is extremely powerful individually he's actually a black mage uh, to, to use a direct term um, so purely destructive magic, very powerful, very strong, and who doesn't want to, to take the seat of power and doesn't want to become a new emperor or whatever and is just trying to help people, but all he can do is set things on fire. Um, we, I, I also want to use this as a storyline to tell how not everyone can be a mage. And of course, I want to tell the tragedy of what happened when the pillar fell. Uh, let, let me explain what I mean by that a little bit. Uh, I want you to picture... Here's all the people who are in charge of the running of the old order, okay? And it's all held up by the pillar of the autocrat, okay? That's that's the main villain who was defeated in the previous storyline. So, you knock out the pillar, what happens to all these people? All these people who are involved in running and managing and otherwise dealing with the everyday function of actually keeping the evil empire going. And I want to tell the story of one of those characters as well. And a couple of other stories. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. So anyways, point being, I was sitting down writing this out. And I was just you know writing all these character arcs. And then I realized I sort of automatically had this idea of a new threat rising up. A completely uh, separate threat. Something completely external to the sector and all the events they're in and being like, oh my gosh. And I started, I was just kind of staring at it like, does that need to exist? And I started thinking about the Thrawn trilogy, the, the example I gave earlier. 10-2 fits this as well, by the way. In both 10-2 and the Thrawn trilogy, there is some big threat. There is some over, over large main antagonist type character with the main antagonist type organization that comes in to cause problems, right? And that's what really got me debating this. I mean, is that the norm? Should I do that just because it's the norm? Hmm. I mean, think about it. I'm reading stuff in chat, sorry. Well, there's tons of little new conflicts. That's not the hard part. I, I cannot, Jongo. I can't think of an example where that doesn't happen, period. Like, I, I, I'm not sure I can come up with another now what story in general. Will be the biggest threat. Uh, a certain character, on the off chance I ever publish this, I'd rather not spoil it. But let's just say it's a certain character who was introduced very early into the series, who is really ambitious in a. How do I put this? Hey, blood brother. Um. There's a difference, in my opinion, between ambitious and Mega Man music. I'm sorry, one moment. There we go. There's a difference, in my opinion, between ambitious and evil ambitious, okay? Um, I know that sounds really weird, but and I could use historical examples, but I should probably shy away from those. Um, I, 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 for my, from my opinion, 
as a writer. I think there's a difference between someone who is very ambitious and wants to rule because they feel like their rule would be better, or that they could do more good ruling, or, you know, something along that lines, instead of someone who wants to rule for the ambitions, or for the, for the benefits of rule. Uh, I've actually talked about that several times, the difference between... Um, the difference between the idea of I want to rule to rule or I want to rule to give the benefits of rule. Fine, I'll go with calmer music. God. I'll go with the calmest music I know. You just gotta give me a second to pull it up. And turn it up. There we go. Well, see, the problem is, Corwin... If I the way I like to write, if I'm going to sit down and write a story, I want to know where the story's going before I put the first word down. That's how I write. You're gonna die. Sorry. One person in chat will get that. Um I, so I don't like Corwin says, can't I just sit down and write the whole story? And if I decide it needs villain A, if I could tag that in. I, I can't actually do that. I'm not even sure I'm capable of doing that, let alone the fact that I don't want to do that. Because if you're, there's going to be some big Doom Pillar thing, the story needs to revolve around that. Let me use Thrawn Trilogy as an example again here. Thrawn is... It's, there's a reason it's called the Thrawn Trilogy. Every single event in the Thrawn Trilogy is overall rotating around this central pillar of Thrawn and his recurrent invasion, right? There's a lot of other stories going around there. We, we we learn about Luke and how he's trying to come to grips with being the last Jedi. We learn about Card and how he's trying to rebuild his own private organization. We learn about Mara and how she's trying to uh, find her place in a galaxy that no longer fits her. We're, we learn about Londo and how he's awesome. You know, when we have all these stories and all these character arcs, but every single one of them orbits the central pillar of Thrawn's reinvasion, and all of them is moved forward by that invasion. This, this is what I refer to, literally speaking, as the central pillar of a work. It doesn't have to be something that everything is directly connected to, but it has to be something that everything is being affected by. Let me use another example. Lavos. Chrono Trigger. There are dozens of different stories and character arcs and little miniature things that are happening throughout the course of Chrono Trigger. But all of them rotate around one central concept, and that concept is Lavos itself. I really prefer that exact type of storytelling right there. Central pillar. Getting back to my point. So if I was to come in with... Hang on. So, if I was to introduce a central villain to my story who flaps in, I need to make sure that I know who this is before I ever start writing. Because if I'm going to have this central villain zooming in, I need to make sure that I know about this before I ever introduce them. So I, know, so I can make sure that everything revolves around this crowbat whose wings are apparently sufficiently green as to be invisible. That's interesting. This thing's huge, by the way. Just to give you an example, it's, it's larger than my head. You see this? Yeah. 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 There we go. Okay. But that brings me back to my central point. Should... Do, do I need a crowbat in my story, basically? Do I... It doesn't have to be an individual. It could be a thing, like Lavos. I just use that as an example. Uh, it could be an organization. It could be a concept. But do I need a central antagonistic th pillar throughout the extant storyline. Because if I do, I need to think of that now and restructure the rest of the stories to rotate around it. He is purple. Actually, it, it, if I could just segue for just a second here as people are answering, answering my actual question. 
Um, Pokemon are in a lot of my stories in canon. In fact, uh, I've been trying to in reintroduce them to uh, the Primus Verge story. Sis and I have... Uh, Uh, wow, that looks terrible, Darkrai. Right? Well, see you around, Gregost. By the way, Jake Kaufman's amazing, I just want to say. I suppose if I was to bring the analogy back down to base, do I need a Thrawn in my... Now what? Are they used in armies? No, actually. I mean, Thrawn wasn't an alien invader from beyond. He was kind of an unknown, but not really. He was basically just the new empire. The, it, if you think about it, Thrawn was actually still a... Now what? Okay, the evil empire is gone. Now we have the slightly greater empire. In fact, it was the first time they ever tried to gray out the Galactic Empire in Star Wars. Was with Thrawn. No, there's no Digimon. I suppose one of the other stories I'm trying to tell with this one is that, uh... <sighs> Damn it, casual. Uh... I want to show a contrast of a setting which is how I think Star Wars could have been and isn't. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we were actually talking about this in Discord just this last week. Um, Star Wars has Jedi, most notably Sith, who are like, I am super invincible, incredibly strong, and I am super godlike powerful. And they act like that, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, they die because they're pathetic. Because, I'm sorry, the Force is not actually that strong. Which I'm fine with. I like that idea. Why is that being weird? Hang on just a second. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Um... But because the Force is just not that powerful, not really. Not when you consider the scale of fiction or, or what things that can be accomplished with technology in the same setting. So, in, uh, <laughs> I agree, Muku, a lot of enemies are like that. Um, so in this setting, I could name every single mage that exists within the Extant storyline. There's one, two, three, four, six. There are six of them. So, to, to use the Force equivalent, imagine a setting... Imagine if there's six Force users total. And imagine if each one of them are pretty damn strong. Like, Final Fantasy level of strength. I don't mean, like, I can crush planets with my hands, but I still mean I could probably take out an army by myself level of power. Um, so, you know, kind of pretty high tier, but not super high tier. Um... And one of the stories I want to tell is how those people are affected by the world around them and how the world around them is affected by those people. So, uh, that's another theme of the work that I'm trying to tell. I, I Actually, I guess I just realized there aren't six. There's four. My bad. I apologize. There were six, and then two of them died. <laughs> And someone's mowing. I apologize for the mowing. I muted the mic, guys. Although, I mean, I guess I was talking earlier. Uh, so I've heard a lot of feedback. Thank you, everyone, 
for all the feedback you guys have given me. Uh, I am paying attention, I swear. I'm thinking about it. I am uh, debating it. Um, a Kraya type antagonist? I could see something like that in Extant. What format? I have no idea, Caspian. Um, so, I suppose this is a good time as any to announce this for anybody who gives a damn. Uh, I've been putting some work into, uh, I, as ironic as this may sound, uh, copywriting some of my stuff. And making it so that I can actually have the ability to safeguard my own work, which has been a problem in the past. I've released some stuff uh, through my site and through my show that have then been plagiarized, and there's been some issues involved with that. And so I have... Uh, and I've, a I've been asked this question several times. I have... I have uh, been putting work into trying to go ahead and uh, set up my own copyright and trademark, actually. Uh, trademarking this sucker right here. So that's already in the works. I literally actually am going into uh, a courthouse this week, I think, uh, depending on when exactly the date is, in order to try and deal with some of this stuff. <sighs> um, nothing bad. No, no issues. This is just related to copyright and trademark. Uh, my copyright and trademarks as opposed to violations or anything like that. But the point being that I could then, once I do that, uh, actually start releasing some of this stuff. And at that point, uh, I might actually be capable of doing things like releasing some of this stuff in uh, either digital or published print, print. I do admit that that's probably never going to happen. But I've always admitted a bit of romanticization with reading an actual physical book. And so I do actually like the idea of being able to sit down and uh, push out something like this. Will probably never happen. Let's just, just let's be blunt. There's actually a decent amount of money that goes into making a physical book. And that means it would have to make a certain number of sales, which it will not do. I am, I am nowhere near big enough to justify that. It's the same reason I don't have t-shirts or anything like that on my show, because... <laughs> Nobody's gonna buy that. Or if they are, like, ten people are going to. Anyways. Um, hey, Tequita. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, let's make sure you voot. This is, this is the cutoff for the voot right here. That's, this is, we're gonna go ahead and cut off this voot. Uh, in, like, five seconds. One. Really long seconds. Two. Three. Really long seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and chop off the recording. I just realized there's no reason. So, for those of you watching on YouTube, goodbye forever.